Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another installment of the Open Worm Journal Club. Today, our topic is DevoWorm, a project that is seeking to reproduce the computational operations of the development of the C. elegans. As you know, the Open Worm project is devoted to building the world's first digital organism. And many folks uh, over the last several years of the project have inquired about what uh, what we are doing with regards to modeling development. And we have never had a good answer until now. A group of passionate folks uh, led here by Dr. Bradley Alicia, who will be talking to you today, uh, have actually taken up this charge and are charging ahead um, with this effort. And uh, we have joined forces um, to uh, combine our approaches, uh, this open science approach to doing the development of the worm. So uh, you'll be hearing from Bradley here today. Um, but first, uh, we have a couple of panelists that are joining us uh, as well um, who uh, are here to ask some questions from the open worm community. So I just want to briefly introduce uh, or have them introduce themselves. So first, we have Rainer Lucas. Rainer, would you introduce yourself? Ah, hey there. Um, yeah, I'm Rainer. I yeah, I'm in London, UK, and uh, I joined Open Worm uh, probably about a year ago now, and I'm currently working on modeling the neuromuscular junctions for the yeah for simulating the worm muscle movements. Terrific! Thanks for joining, and we also have Mark Watts. Hi, uh, I'm Mark. Uh, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I was a Google Summer of Code student this summer, and uh, I worked on the PyOpenWorm and Worm uh, data access library. Terrific. Thanks for joining us. All right, and so now we will go to Bradley, uh, who will introduce himself and then uh, kick off uh, his presentation about DevoWorm. All right. I'm Bradley Alicia. Uh, I'm a independent researcher. And I have uh, I've worked on numerous projects, one of them being DevoWorm. I have, uh, have a broad interest in biology and in computing. Uh, one of those things, of course, is development and modeling development. Terrific. Start the talk here. All right. So yeah, raising the open worm. That's our subtitle, and you can see our collaborators on the slide. It's a distributed group. We talk, we get together every so often and hash out the details. And so this is what we've come up with. We started it, you know, in last spring, and uh, this is so. This is not like an advanced stage of the project. This is sort of the beginnings of it. So let's get started. Um, so we think of our efforts as a hackathon, and um, that can mean a lot of things, I guess. So what we do here is this is this project is a rare combination. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to hack development in a computing environment or in silico. Uh, we want to extend the accomplishments of Open Worm by focusing on development, where that adult phenotype comes from that people in Open Worm like to model. But we're also doing interpretive hacking. So this is a little more subtle. Uh, this is we want to get a better idea of some of the generative processes of development, the, the possibilities of development. And this can be done through going to the theoretical literature, uh, appealing to theoretical concepts, and incorporating them somehow into this project. So uh, why are we interested in C. elegans development? As Stephen said, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an unanswered question in the, in the purview of Open Worm. So C. elegans actually has some unique properties from the standpoint of biologists. Uh, embryogenesis in what they call mosaic development, which of which C. elegans has that mode of development, is analytically tractable. So as you all may know, C. elegans has 959 cells in the adult hermaphrodite and 1,031 cells in the adult male. Now that's in the adult. Uh, in development, of course, we start from a single cell, and we'll get into that later. Uh, roughly 850 of these cells are unique and 50 pairs are equivalent pairs. So we know not only how many cells exist in the adult, and it doesn't vary across organisms, but we know things about this, you know, subsets of cells 
and the development of cells. So they, uh, you know, as the cells uh, divide from its precursor, we know something about that process as well. Uh, C. elegans is also what they call a eutelic organism. So each adult individual in the species has a fixed number of cells. So this, these cells are not only like, you know, you have a fixed number. In humans, of course, we have trillions of cells and we can regenerate cells all the time. In C. elegans, the number of cells in the adult is fixed uh, and you can actually build what they call a lineage tree. So you, it's, it's a deterministic process and that's the important thing to remember. Um, the cell lineages are invariant across individuals. There are small differences between males and hermaphrodites, but those can be characterized. And, but there are two features of development in C. elegans that are ripe for revisitation. So we understand a lot, actually, about the biology of C. elegans development. We understand about the lineages, we understand about the number of cells that are generated, but, you know, that's not entirely, you know, nailed down, uh, but we also don't know, for example, that if development is, you know, it's a generative but invariant. So how does this happen? How do we get this type of development in C. elegans versus, say, like development in humans? And the other thing we don't really know about C. elegans is that we don't really understand the developmental symmetry along the multiple axes of the phenotype. So, you know, you think about uh, humans, we have, you know, we have a width, we have height and we have depth in our bodies. And we, you know, what, how does development unfold along those axes? We'll get a little bit into that as well later to give you, put some flesh on the bones of that, those ideas. So I guess, why development? And maybe some of you are familiar with development, maybe some less so. So I'm not going to get into the biology right now. What I want to do first is I want to ask two questions. Um, so what we see in open worm is the is. We see the worm as it is in its adult stage. But development really focuses on how that got there. And you can look at it, you know, from a purely biological standpoint, or you can look at it from a more mathematical standpoint. And that's what these two gentlemen have done. Uh, these are historical figures. One on the left is Darcy Thompson. He wrote a book on growth and form, which is a uh, tract about a hundred and some years old. It, he basically argued that uh, development is geometrical, that, you know, there's a geometrical aspect to development that biologists typically don't, or at least at the time, you know, they're embryologists studying embryos, but they didn't really appreciate the sort of the mathematical aspect of development. Um, and then Renee Tom, who came a little bit later after Darcy Thompson, who wrote a book, Structural Stability and Morphogenesis, he had the same sort of focus on understanding development or the structure of a phenotype as a series of mathematical transformations or isomorphic mappings. So on the right you can see this figure, this is from an Art Nature Reviews genetics article where you can take a single fish species and you can put a grid over it and you can pick landmarks on the, on the fish. So you can pick the gill and the uh, different fins and mark their point on the grid. And then you can take that grift, grid, lift it off, and put it onto other species of fish. And you can move those grid points that you made on the first fish to those landmarks on the, on the other related fishes. And you can get transformations of that grid. And so that's what they're showing here. And so that basically describes what we're dealing with in development. We're dealing with the following. Every uh, organism really starts out as an egg or as a sphere, and you're, from that sphere you're going to get a great diversity of phenotypes. And so our interest is in how that gets there. Um, and then we also want to look at function and structure, so we know the function of the phenotype in the adult as well, and that has a lot to do with the structure. But how are those two things? Really? So Nico Tingbergen, who was actually a, a behaviorist, um, proposed a model for development. He proposed the idea that uh, one way to understand function and structure even is to understand how traits arise in development. And so he had uh, elaborate models of how things get into the adult. You know, one, uh, one thing is that you have evolution that puts it there, but a more proximate 
cause of phenotype and function is development. And so we, if we understand development, we can understand a lot of things about the adult that we didn't understand before. So this is a picture. So this is, I'm going to talk about our data sets later, but this is a picture of the P0 uh, embryo in C. elegans. So this is before there's a differentiation. This is a single cell. So this is a gonadal stage cell. And I want you to appreciate when I go through these slides how things differentiate in, and develop. So that was P0. Now we go to a uh, later stage of division where we start to see a lineage emerge. So now instead of one cell on the left, we have four founder cells on the right. So this is where we have two cell divisions from that original. And you have now you have this emergence of this AB lineage. So you start off with the founder cell, which is AB, and then you get two cells in a lineage, which is you know ABP, which is posterior, and ABA, which is anterior, and you have two other cells in the embryo. But as you see, those cells divide, and in turn the AB lineage starts to subdivide, and you start to get clumps of uh, cells in here that are part of that AB lineage. They are dividing in different orientations in the embryo, and they're actually going to form structures in the embryo and then eventually in the organism as it become you know as it goes through development so here we actually have a new lineage MS which actually divides from a single founder cell and a new lineage C and so these these lineages are going to form organs and other structures in the adult and as you see in the embryo in early stages of development you have you know just uh, clumps of cells that have divided but they're going to take on even greater form as, as development goes on. And so now you have even more, a greater a compl a number of cells and you have new lineages arising at later stages of development. And so the, these uh, microscopy images are actually part of our data set that we have access to. And this is from the White Lab at the University of Wisconsin. So they were uh, gracious enough to share their data with us. So they had uh, microscopy data from years ago, and they actually got found it and let us have it. And we're planning on analyzing these further um, in terms of using um, pattern recognition software. But that's that's not relevant right now. So um, you notice that in the first four lineage, let's take the AB lineage as an example. So the first four cells of the AB lineage, as shown here on the left, we have a specific sort of order of placement. So it isn't that they just divide and subdivide at random. They actually divide and subdivide along axes. And as you can see, one is posterior left posterior of the founder cell. The other is posterior um, left anterior and so forth. And so the original founder cell actually dies, but you get these four uh, cells that emerge, you know, that divide from that founder cell, the descendants. But it's important to remember that they op they divide in three different axes. So anterior, posterior, left to right, dorsal to ventral, just top to bottom. And that's the 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 sort of the way the the, the body plan arises is through these coordinated divisions in different dimensions. Um, now it's important to remember at C. elegans and this is unlike mammalian embryos like humans or cows or mice, they have a specified pattern of embryogenesis. So in the case of C. elegans, it's the deterministic system of, of, of development. But in, in mammals and in other organisms, it's actually much more of a stochastic process, and that's why people do stuff like this in C. elegans, because you can't really do it in mammals. Although, as we'll see, there are certain things we can learn from um, vertebrates and apply it to C. elegans. So how to understand, now we have a little bit of a primer on development, well at least, you know, a little bit of development. We, our business here is to build an emulation and to build an emulation we're going to go to theoretical constructs and make certain assumptions. So we're building a model of development and we're using theoretical constructs to tell us kind of what that should be how that should be, and 
we're incorporating that into an emulation or into an emulation framework. So um, a little background on this project, Evil Worm. Um, in the vi beginning, there was a vision for whole organism emulation, and it was good, and that was Cyberworm. Um, and I'm not clear on the history, but Openworm, of course, is a realiza one realization of that, and that's been developed. But again, it deals with the adult worm. And so how do we deal with development? And so uh, Richard Gordon, who is, I think he's here, uh, he wrote a book here, The Hierarchical Genome and Differentiation Waves. And that book is one of our guiding um, lights in this project. We're using his theories, and we're trying to reinterpret some of the things we know about development. Uh, so, and those of you involved in the Open Worm Project are already aware, of course, of lineage trees, which is from Solston, who won a Nobel Prize for his work on C. elegans. Um, and they basically took all the cells that I showed you, and they took all those lineages, and they put, built a tree. And the tree is uh, ordered from front to back, anterior to posterior, from front to back, and it gives you information about the lineages. So the lineages are all the cells in the adult can be traced back to a P0 cell, and you have information about how they branch. And it was worked out by Solston in a number of papers. But it doesn't really describe the developmental process, it just describes going from P0 to those adult cells. Um, but, you know, it doesn't give you any information about development itself. It doesn't give you any spatial information, for example. It doesn't give you any information about what's going on in the embryo. It just tells you, like, a, a map from P0 to the cell. So, again, lineage trees are merely, merely descriptive. It's a, it tells you whom begat whom, and it's, in that sense, it's very much like a lineage of, of uh, human generations, like your ancestors who begat whom, but it doesn't tell you anything about what your ancestors did or how they came to build that lineage, you know. Uh, it, it doesn't tell you much about that. And In development, it's even worse because we know that in the cells, in the, in the organism, and we can see this in development, that the branching process is actually multidimensional. And they do incorporate multidimensional information in their, uh, in their nomenclature. But it, this structure doesn't give you much information about that. So lineage trees are really organized along one of these axes, and the rest of the information is sort of implicit in the names of the cells in, in the naming convention. But we're interested in capturing this three-dimensional structure here, as you see on the bottom right. We want to know a little bit more. We want to know a little bit more about the three-dimensional structure of the organism. After all, that's important to open room. We want to know something about the geometry as opposed to just knowing the descent line of descent. So one solution to this is to use the same information as we did in the lineage tree, but move to something called a differentiation tree. And this is, you know, it's a little, um, at first when you look at it, it, you know, it doesn't look too different than a lineage tree but it actually is in a number of ways. Uh, for one, a reordering of how the cells are organized in the lineage. So in a lineage tree, it's from front to back. In the differentiation tree, it goes from small cell to large cell. So you have some information about the cell size, about the nature of cell division. We also have information about symmetrical versus asymmetrical divisions. As I told you, that's one difference in development in C. elegans is that not all cell divisions are equal in this regard. And we can even add in information about rotation and development. So when a cell divides in a certain orientation, if it goes from you know left to right to anterior, posterior, or dorsal ventral, we can capture that information as well. So, um, but we do have two technical problems in our work here. One is how do we represent multi, the multivariate attributes of branching lineages? So I've already showed you one way maybe that we can do it is through the differentiation tree. Uh, but also how do we integrate a multitude of, ver multitude of data types? And so I'm just throwing those questions out there. I don't have a solution to those. But those are two 
technical problems that one would have to do this, uh, the differentiation tree gives you one guidepost towards solving one of those problems. But we also keep in mind that we're integrating a multitude of data types or that we'd be interested in doing that because that's important to know. Like, for example, is, is it development important? What are, how does development unfold? What's important? Is it the cell morphology? Is it the shape of the embryo? Or is it gene expression? And then depending on who you ask, what kind of biologist you ask, you might get a different answer. So in the future, we'd like to get a multitude of data types and integrate them. But at the same time, that's a lot of information, and we need to really kind of find the best route forward. You know, We don't want to throw everything in the pot. So differentiation tree is also important because it gives us an idea of what some people like to call the epigenetic landscape. Um, Conrad Waddington uh, talked about that. He lived around mid-century, and he often talked about epigenetic landscapes. And epigenetic landscapes are uh, like possibility spaces for development. So you have this tree embedded in this surface, and imagine that each branch is a pathway of development. So say any, you know, say when you go from the circular embryo any phenotype is really possible. Well, that's not really true, but let's assume that it is, that there are a wide range of phenotypes that one can get from this egg. And somehow, if you, say, have a C. elegans egg, it always goes through very similar steps to get to a C. elegans adult. And a frog egg, which looks very similar, you know, in the embryonic stage, will take a, a host of different steps to get to a frog. And so the question is, you know, that ostensibly, you know, if you think of the egg as the root of this tree, they follow different paths, through, you know, different branches through the tree, and they come out at different points. And so the question is, you know, maybe we can find out more about that process. You know, maybe differentiation trees will give us, enlighten us more about those different, how, not only how they differ, but how individuals in the same species can remain on the same path. And we have, like, there are other clues, and people know something about this, but representing it in that way is a little bit more useful than the, just using a lineage tree. So, um, but a little bit more on differentiation trees. So we're making, actually, a fairly large assumption here. It's not outrageous, but it's uh, an assumption. And differentiation trees are really based on the outcome of collective cellular behavior. So, uh, Dick Gordon, in his work, he's observed things called expansion and contraction waves through the embryo. So these are communications or signals that are sent across different parts of the embryo, different sets of cells. It could be through different, any different number of mechanisms. But the important thing to remember is that as cells are together in the embryo, they signal one another. And one of the ways that they tell their neighbors or uh, the cells are coordinated to do something in development is through triggering something called a cell state splitter. And this is a, uh, like a some, in, in this case, we're going to look at uh, the cytoskeletal structure. So in the theory, and it's been observed in some, in um, well, we'll get into that in a bit, uh, but there are certain structures in the cell that will respond to these cues and send a binary signal, say like in the cytoskeleton, once it's triggered, it will send a binary signal to the genotype. It'll be a change of a piece of information that changes the state of the cell. So it sends it to the genome, and the genome responds in a binary fashion. The idea is that it's a binary signal that you can that development proceeds by these binary splits, like a tree, and that it can cells can go from say like a pluripotent phenotype, which is a uh, you know, all-purpose phenotype to something specialized, some sort of organ or some sort of tissue. So the cell can become very differentiated from that original purpose type cell through a number of steps, but that requires a number of uh, cell state splitter actions. So um, if you're interested, there's another paper by Lukai and Richard Gordon on, it's a biosystems paper on the cell state splitter. And the idea here is that you get something that triggers the cell. You know, you might it, 
there are a host of mechan possible mechanisms here, um, basically in the site of skeleton, and it signals the uh, genome in the nucleus, and it creates this uh, gene expression cascade, which allows for this differentiation to occur. And then this is how you get this, of course, across uh, groups of cells, and so this is how you get differentiation from the sphere to, you know, organs and tissues and all that sort of thing. So that's an assumption, and it's there. It, we have, it, uh, you know, borne out by some data. In C. elegans, is a little less borne out. Uh, people haven't done exactly those experiments. That's what I mean by that. But you know, that's what theor theory is, right? You have a very general statement, and you try to apply it. It guides your work. So. Um, are mechanical signals the only possible mechanism for the splitter? Well, I mean, you know, we've observed it with mechanical signals, and we've theorized that it's mechanical in origin, but in C. elegans, the mechanism could be mechanical. It could be something called juxtacrine signaling, which exists in C. elegans, or it could be cell movement, some combination of factors. Um, and then the genetic contributions to C. elegans develop. Is it fair to exclude most of those relationships from our model because we've been concentrating on cells and what cells are doing, but we haven't talked about the genotype? If you talk to a, a geneticist, they might not be so comfortable with that. If you talk to a biochemist, they probably think, well, why are you modeling this without modeling genes and putting every gene in and, you know, really kind of building a model that way? Well, I understand, you know, it's fair, I guess it's a fair question, but it's also, I think, fair to exclude those relationships, at least um, in detail. Um, we can learn a lot from the cell biology, and if it, we think, I, I, at least I think, that it's the most inclusive approach when we're building our abstraction. Because remember, from a computing standpoint, this is an abstraction. This is not like we're not trying to build every single detail of the, the organism. We're just trying to build enough so that we can emulate these processes. And so differentiation trees and differentiation waves are one way to do that in terms of developmental processes as well. Um, and uh, as a general rule, these trees and waves are not really just made up. Uh, they actually have roots in the biochemistry of the embryo and the biology of the embryo. And this was something that was advanced by Turing. So it also has a, a, a Turing, I mean, had similar ideas about reaction diffusion models. And so, um, you know, if computer scientists in the past were thinking about it, it's probably not really that big of an assumption to make. Um, but before I get into Turing's work, I'd like to talk a little bit about regulative versus mosaic development. So when I talk about differentiation trees and all this, a lot of that has been worked out in axolotls and regulative development. Regulative development is what we have and what axolotls have, which are um, amphibians. Uh, but uh, what about C. elegans? Well, and so regulative development just simply means that you have cells that arise and then their gene expression changes and they d differentiate, and the number of cells in fixed cells can change their fate depending on the needs. In some organisms, you get a lot of regeneration of limbs and things like that that go on outside of formal development. Um, but that, that process is largely stochastic. So our process is more deterministic. Um, but we actually, or Richard has actually mapped the things that happen in regulative development and maybe some of the things we should see in mosaic development. So, for example, in regulative development, we should expect contraction waves. That's what our theory predicts. Uh, also, in, in mosaic development, though, we don't have this, quite the same type of uh, action or organization. So we map this to something like a small cell for, resulting from an asymmetric division. Similarly, with something called expansion waves, which are a different form of this sort of, uh, uh, you know, this differentiation uh, scheme, we can map this to something called large cell in an asymmetric division. So, and then cell proliferation without further differentiation uh, gets mapped to symmetric cell division yielding two equal sized cells of the same type as their mother cell. So there, 
uh, in this case, we're taking things from regulative development and we're mapping them to what we should expect in mosaic development, simply because they're different processes. But they should unfold because it's, they're both developmental processes. They should unfold um, in an analogous way. So now we want to ground our theory in the process of development a little bit more. So to talk about that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the ideas from Turing and then some other things while making this, you know, uh, kind of thinking about how to make this more realistic. So I include this quote by George Box. He's a famous statistician, and he had this quote that was, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So this is a good thing to keep in mind when we talk about models, is that they're all wrong in the sense that they're not supposed to be the thing itself, but they're useful. They tell us things. And our model might well be wrong in some ways, but it's useful. Uh, so but what can we do with it? And that's really the question. If it's useful, then you have to use it. And so one thing we can do with this model uh, is predict the effects of a mutant phenotype. So in development, you get mutants. And this is sometimes it's a failure of the developmental processes. Sometimes it's just a consequence of environmental factors. But in, in making this useful, one potential use is to predict the effects of these mutant phenotypes. Um, and this, we talked about this in our group. And this may require a little bit more than just the standard uh, data and theoretical model. This might require something called an EvoDevo simulation. And um, one of our collaborators, Steve McGrew, has an idea for a model called Alfred, which is applying like a genetic algorithm, making it a little bit more developmental in nature, and then modeling the development of phenotypes, but using an evolutionary algorithm to do the heavy lifting of the developmental process. It's entirely a simulation, but it can give you, you know, it's a generative model, so it can give you a range of answers. It can produce a range of answers that you can then evaluate using a fitness function or some other mechanism. Um, so we can do things like that, and that's interesting to biologists. But we can also do something a little bit more ephemeral, and that is to make greater generalizations to the nature of eutelic organisms themselves, especially eutelic organisms that undergo mosaic development. Um, so that group of organisms, we can learn something, of, you know, maybe theoretical lessons about their development by doing this project. So in that case, we can look at, like, when the structure of a differentiation tree changes. So we build a differentiation tree from our data, and we're able to change it around in some way. What are the functional consequences of changing that around? As I remember I said in C. elegans, that the nature of the differentiation tree or the lineage tree even is deterministic. So if we change that tree, the topology, what are the consequences in the adult? This, this actually might be of use to experimentalists in terms of understanding mutants, mutant phenotypes, or you know maybe for synthetic biologists, but it would also be of use to uh, openworm people. To know something about, like, you know, what would happen if you had, I mean, are there ways to, you know, if you have a variety of phenotypes, what is, what's a, the anatomical consequence of that? You know, it, it's informative to a host of different uh, groups of people. And some of that may require experimental validation, but that's sort of one of our goals here, long term goals, is to integrate this with. You know, experimentation with education with uh, other modeling initiatives. So I'm going to go quickly through this problem, and maybe I should have started with this, but actually I debated about this, and I decided this was about the time to do this. So these are slides from Richard Gordon's talks on differentiation waves. So they look a little different, and he lays out the problem of development of why we would want a theoretical basis for development and why that's important. So th there's a problem that he likes to talk about here. Uh, why is it that this sphere here, which is your, your, an egg and, and the sperm is fertilizing it, this is in a mammal, but you know, why is it that this sphere, how does it go from this to this asymmetrical body on the right? 
how do you go from a symmetrical form to an asymmetrical form that grows, increases greatly in the number of cells? How do you do that? I mean, you'd think that it, you know, if you were an alien coming to Earth, you'd think, well, how do you grow a, a human? Well, you get a really small human, maybe, you know. You don't think about the transformations as much, uh, but they exist. And so cons consider a spherical cow. This is something physicists like to do, but it's actually something that we're doing here because we're considering a uh, cow embryo. And we're considering how that, or a group of, of uh, you know, like a blastocyst or something, can become a cow. How do you go from spheres, you know, a lump of spheres as we see here, to this cow? with organs and shape, it's asymmetrical. I mean, there's some symmetry there, but a lot of the body is asymmetrical as well. It's not a sphere. And so, in regulative development, this B actually comes from a morphogenetic process. So this is where, not just embryogenesis, but where you're building a form. And a similar outcome is also observed in mosaic development. So here we have our cells you know, our, our embryo, which has a couple of round cells in it, and now it becomes this worm that's not entirely asymmetrical, but it's highly differentiated from the sphere form. So, again, like I, I said before, that Turing had some ideas on this, and of course Alan Turing, everyone knows who Alan Turing is, and he came up with something called a reaction diffusion morphogenesis model. And the, the important thing about this is it's a symmetry breaking model. And so, in this case, you have a couple differential equations, which represents uh, a process, a chemical process, that produces spatial and temporal information. So what happens is you have the soup, and you have what happens is you have fluctuations in the concentrations of, of chemicals, and over time that turns into spatial gradients, and if you add in some temporal timing information, you can get things like, you know, stripes and other, you know, that they, the different chemicals segregate into compartments and all that. So he built a mathematical model of that. But you can also visualize it. And in this case, I have a fictitious organism called Ballus totus. Uh, the reason I call it that is because it looks like a toad, but it's also a sphere. It remains spherical, pretty much. And in this case, you go from a sphere that's kind of uh, multicolored to a sphere that takes on some uh, some dots, and then it starts to form uh, spikes, and then it becomes even spikier. So it looks like a toad, and it has little dots on it. But that all emerges from this undifferentiated mass here, and that happens through this spontaneous organization that, um, I mean, happens through symmetry breaking. So this is symmetrical at the top, and then as you go through the process, there are these fluctuations that cause reactions, cause symmetry breaking, that produce these uh, spatial segregations that produce these features. And so this is just more about a symmetry breaking model. The interesting thing is, is that there's physical evidence for this outside of morphogenesis, and that comes from Clark Maxwell and Lord Raleigh, who discussed, uh, like, uh, capillary forces and uh, set the ring formation of Saturn in, in much the same way. So this is actually more of a physical thing than a biological thing, but we can actually use it to inform ourselves about development, biological development. Okay, so now let's move on. So now, how can we emulate such a complex process? I mean, this looks really complicated. And I started out, and I was, I guess I started out making it seem like it's a piece of cake, and now we're moving into all this complicated stuff, mathematics and models, and so, but how can we emulate that? Well, remember I said before we're abstracting thing, abstracting information, so we're not using every aspect of the process, we're just trying to approximate it in some way. But we're also trying to measure it, we're trying to characterize it. So, we can do this but we have to use a multitude of data, and we have to use some information informatics framework that makes sense of everything. So we've been exploring this, and one way to do this is to use an RDF framework. So we have semantic data. So we have semantic data that describes the cells themselves and their what they are. 
So we know, and this is from the OpenWorm project, we have a database that has semantic tags. So each cell has a series of descriptions that are attached to it. And they act as metadata. So we can operate do operations on the metadata. We can take the tags, that information, and map them to a tree structure. Um, we can do this without any other data, but it's, you know, we end up with our lineage tree. So we want to go beyond that. But nevertheless, the semantic data is useful. It can give a, you know, it's, it's computationally tractable. It's based on XML, but at the same time, it is informative. Um, and then, of course, we need a data structure. So uh, if you've, any of you have read the white paper, or if you haven't read the white paper, which is on the web, uh, if, you, if you go to my personal website, if you go to, I don't know if it was included in the abstract, I think I included it in the abstract. We talk about this proposed solution. So we use a data structure that is extensible. You know, you can expand it as much as you want. The idea is you would have three tuples of information plus context. So you would have spatial three tuples, which would give you like a location in a three-dimensional space. Plus you could describe other things in, in you know, like some other context to this. Uh, so you can have a spatial three-tuple or a temporal three-tuple, which would be cell size, division event number, and the angle of differentiation. And so not the data that we have here that I described, the semantic data, doesn't give us all that. But we can get it from other sources and plug it into this framework. Um, so we can use metadata as a means to relate objects. So we can relate objects in the embryo. And here are some of our data. We have information about uh, lineage, so we have information about a cell, an, uh, a mother cell and daughter cells. We have other information as well, but it's all structured um, in a relational manner. Uh, we also can define objects. So this is again from OpenWorm. We can define subclasses of cell. We can define uh, lineage and cell identity in the context of that lineage. So we can do a lot of things like that. We can associate, but we can also associate objects with other metadata. So we can take, say for example, a cell and it has attributes, and we can say something about its development. But then we can also point people to sort uh, references, literature. So uh, PubMed might have ten different papers on this one gene expression in this one cell, or something, some other developmental information about this one cell, and you can go get that. You know, it's a lot like um, genome annotation, where you have a list of genes, and then people will annotate it. Um, sometimes the annotations, you know, they try to give you a single annotation, but that isn't really useful. You have to go through the literature and kind of put together what the function is. Well, in this case, we're kind of doing this with cells. We have links to PubMed references, so people can get whatever they need out of that. We can attach a lot of different, you know, a lot of information about what that cell is to the thing. Um, and so this is a pseudocode uh, showing the relational attributes of a differentiation tree. Uh, this is, you know, just kind of like basic, but it's just this first pass at it. Um, and then how do you visualize this? So eventually we'll want to visualize it. And this is where I, I kind of ask for the community's help here, because we've never done this. And our idea, I think, is to use something like um, unified data access of PyMol. But, you know, they're, what we're basically trying to do is we're trying to build a radial or three-dimensional topology using semi-structured data. So we don't have a lot, we don't necessarily have a lot of classificatory information. We have some, but it's, you know, we'd like to be able to visualize this uh, very quick, down and do a down and dirty uh, visualization of the tree. So, I mean, there, there are different ways we've been playing around with the idea. This isn't really well developed yet, but if anyone has any ideas on how to do this really effectively, uh, please let us, any of us in the project know, uh, especially Steve Larson or myself. So, I thought that was a quick overview of the informatics, and I wanted to include that so that it get people thinking about it. Um, because there's a lot of expertise in this group, and I'd like maybe draw from it. Um, and so what is the potential for this approach? I did mention the potential, actually, before, but let's talk more about the potential. 
uh, does this mean you fully understand development at the end of this project that we're going to really understand development and there's no, work, no more work that needs to be done? Well, no. No, that's not at all true. But, but we have this sort of 25,000 meter view. You know, it's like the future vision. You can see the whole landscape in front of you. Um, so what can be do with what can be done with DEVO and why do it? Well, we want to incorporate the developmental principles into the scheme of the open worm emulation. We want to have a greater understanding of biological processes behind development, you know, behind the adult C. elegans. Um, and we want to have a platform that we can expand to future simulations. So as we learn more, as we get more access to more data, as we build uh, you know, maybe build functionality or something, we can extend it to that. Um, but what features could be added in the future? I said before that we have an inclusive approach by focusing on cells, but we can also add genetic complexity. And certainly that's important if you want to really understand development and maybe the nuances of development. Understanding genetic complexity is probably key. And we can incorporate real data or algorithmic um, you know, approximation there. We also have, uh, we could also provide an experimental prediction engine. This is like before when I talked about predicting mutants, phenotypic mutants, to make that process more um, more predictive and more useful. Um, so what happens when a specific experimental manipulation is performed? So if you were to, say for example, have a digital embryo and grow it out to a certain point, and then do some manipulation to it. What would be the consequence in the adult? And that's really kind of a far out idea. Um, it's hard to say whether, I mean, you could do it in C. elegans better than you could do it, say, in regulative development. But I think, you know, that's, that's something that maybe we could do in the future. And also to look at biological diversity. So we, in our data set, the, this microscopy data set, we think we have two hermaphrodites. And we, but we want to know something about, like, you know, the differences maybe between males and hermaphrodites. It's not clear so much from the literature that that's really been a focus of work. People have, you know, said, okay, males have slightly a slightly different number of cells than hermaphrodites, but to, to fit all that, you know, to really get a better handle on that diversity. Maybe it isn't as simple as we thought. That's a possibility, too. Um, I know I've done work in um, different areas, and people kind of shy away in, in biology. A lot of people who do medical research kind of shy away from diversity. You know, the people who are more evolutionary oriented will go, you know, move towards diversity, but, you know, they probably don't like experimental noise. So, you know, these sorts of things, you learn a lot from engaging diversity head on, but it's hard. Uh, so this is my overview of an emulation. So in this case, we have a robotic dog has a body that looks like a dog. It does some simple behaviors like a dog. It's a very nice body, but how did it get there? Well, people who built Sparco, they built it for one of the world's fairs in the 30s, I think. And they just built a body, constructed an adult body, programmed some behaviors, and there you go. Well, it doesn't really emulate a dog. It emulates, like, well, I mean, it does emulate a dog, but not entirely. It's a very simple emulation. I want to know maybe how it got there. That would give us a little more information. And in this case, you have uh, the Human Brain Initiative in Europe, where they're trying to simulate the human brain using supercomputers. So in this case, they're they're looking at how you get to a human brain. That's a nice goal to say, like you can take, uh, an, if you you say you simulate a single cell on a supercomputer. Well, if you can do that somewhat successfully, then all you have to do is scale it up to the number of neurons in the human brain. That's a nice goal, and it looks like a nice scaling, but how do you get there developmentally? And I can tell you it's not going to look like this. It's going to look much different, and it's probably going to behave, something scaled up to the human brain will behave much different than the actual human brain. So these are our challenges with, um, sim, you know, with emulation. We can make something that looks like something, or we can make something that seems to get to that goal in a certain way, but it isn't necessarily development itself. It isn't necessarily the worm itself. And so there are missing components to this sort of whole organism emulation. And the worm may be able to address some of these issues, but really sometimes this is a larger feature or maybe bug of 
whole organism emulation. Um, so what does it mean to be not biological enough? So if we have a model that doesn't really reflect the biology, why is that? Um, you know, we also maybe can address some of the differences in the, you know, some of the diversity in developmental processes. So there may be some stochasticity in C. elegans development. We don't really know. The way we've studied it hasn't led us to that conclusion, but we don't know. Maybe there is. Uh, it's also a very generative process, but how do you go from generating a lot of, you know, differentiated cells to having something that always turns out to be very similar in morphology? You know, that's, that's a question we could kind of shed some light on. And then it's important to remember that in biology, organizing principles are not hard rules. We're constraints. So, you know, in computing, we think of, you know, rules and constraints as being, you know, um, you know, they're, they're right out in front there. In biology, it's not as, you know, it's not as constraining. You could, things can happen, things happen on their own that, that are surprising, that are chaotic. Um, so there's that, and that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, in the you know in the future when you think about emulating organisms, um, so you know when we talk about biological realism, and this is sort of getting to the end of the talk, and I wanted to include a little bit about this. So making model, we can't make models that are more biologically realistic. In RD morphogenesis, it's a chemical model adapted to an embryo, but it doesn't really describe every aspect of embryonic development. So it only describes like pattern formation and things like that. So we abstract maybe development to pattern formation because it's tractable, but there are other dimensions of morphogenesis. So in, in uh, one set of recent studies, uh, they've modeled the effects of local self-enhancement and long-range inhibition in hydroembryos. So this is work that Tim Warrington, part of our group, actually pointed us to. Um, it's uh, Meinhardt, he's out of Germany. And they built models of a uh, very simple genetic circuit, nodal left E2, which is involved in um, early development of, of uh, the phenotype. And um, it, that gene circuit and the gene expression in that circuit, as it turns out, that gene circuit is regulated in development and it has, a, it has consequences for enabling uh, autocatalytic interactions between cells and it helps to shape the phenotype in different ways. So depending on whether it triggers activation or inhibition in certain populations of cells depends on the shape and the structure of the phenotype and development. But this is all dependent on the gene circuit in each cell and how that's regulated is important. So this is very different from the RD morphogenesis model, but it deals with the same phenomenon. Different route to that same thing. Um, but also we also have an opportunity here to take advantage of new technologies to incorporate them into an emulation. So in this case, there are new technologies like single cell transcriptomics, and this is a, one of many different new uh, high throughput gene technologies that exist where you can take single cells and measure the transcriptome, measure how the genes are being expressed. And there are all sorts of really interesting uh, technologies, and if we can get maybe collaborators and some data we could incorporate that into our models as well, much in the same way that they were able to incorporate a gene circuit into hydro development. That operates much the same way as, say, RD morphogenesis operates at the phenotypic level. So, and then I will conclude with showing you examples of phenotypic mutants, just to show you that they exist and what they look like. This is, uh, this is pleiotropy in development, so this is where genes interact and give you different mutations, phenotypic mutations, depending on the strain of the organism and how it's raised. So in this case, you have a worm that's raised in abundant food at 15 degrees Celsius. This is another strain, or this is, I think this is the same strain, or maybe a little different strain, raised at a different temperature. Uh, there's a hermaphrodite maintained at 15 C at a different stage in development. Uh, so you can see that there's variation in development depending on the environmental conditions and the strain. And so that's the type of thing that, you know, when I talk about diversity in development, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And the experimentalists are really interested in finding out why you get those phenotypic mutations. And we might not be able to answer that directly right now, but that's sort of the idea. 
of where we're headed so that we can understand those kind of variations. And so if you're modeling a, a archetypical worm, you know, well, what are the consequences of phenotypic mutation? And how do you get there? And how do you incorporate that into a, a static model? So, okay, so we're at the end of the talk, and I just want to remind everyone that Diebel Worm is an open science and collaborative endeavor, just like Open Worm. Uh, thanks go to Open Worm for programming support and data. Uh, the Salston Research Group for the semantic data. Um, the White Research Group at University of Wisconsin for the microscopy data. Uh, the Geo database for some gene expression data is, you know, is a sort of a first pass at that. And I'd also, I have your funding initiative here on the left. If anyone's interested in funding, you know, we're trying to get grants, but, uh, you know, we're open to, you know, monetary, uh, you know, assistance too. So funding initiatives are welcome. We're working on getting funding for this. It's a pretty new initiative, so it's not that, you know, troubling. We don't have any funding, but that's okay. Uh, we also have collaborators, GitHub. We use GitHub. The Open Worm, of course. My organization, Orthogonal Research, which is an independent group, and Steve McGrew's group, New Light Industries. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions now. Yeah, there's a lot of noise and static on there. All right. All right. How about now? Yeah, it's fine now. Okay. Okay, okay great. Uh, let me actually just try plugging it back in and see if it's just a headphone. All right. Test. We, does, it, does that work again, or is it still noisy? Uh, it's a little noisy, but I can hear you. Okay. All right, so a question from uh, Richard, who joined us uh, a while back. And you might want to go off the screen share, by the way, because uh, we're just oh, okay. watching me uh, through your screen. Right. Um, so uh, Richard asked, uh, the founder cell doesn't die. It just divides into two new kinds of cells, right? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. OK. OK, cool. So just to, just to confirm that, great. Um, so I was, I was wanted to show a couple things, actually, that are related to this, uh, just as other jumping off points, too. Um, so just for folks, uh, and we've talked about this kind of stuff, too. But so there is this effort called Worm Guides uh, that has been collecting uh, more and more data, sort of updating uh, data like the kind that, uh, that the White Lab has created uh, using techniques of sort of tracking all of the cells as they go into development. And uh, there's some nice little animated GIFs here. There's also um, an iOS app that they put out, which is actually kind of fun to play with. Um, so they're kind of trying to work on, on um, getting even more 3D spatial data. And then um, in terms of some of the generative approaches, I just wanted to point folks to at some other academic work. Um, some in neuroscience like this from um, the CX3D uh, group. Uh, this In this video, um, a layer of neuronal cells are actually um, being developed. And so, of course, neuronal cells also have this property that they have extended processes. So these little circles here are sort of representing cells as they move and migrate and um, do some differentiation. So sort of a, a different dynamic look that's comparable, uh, that's, that's compatible and complementary to um, understanding the different lineage trees. It sort of looks at these sort of different layers um, differentiating out in what would be a little piece of, of say, uh, cerebral cortex. And then um, recently, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you guys about this as much, um, I found a simulator called CompuSol 3D, which is another project uh, that also looks at um, kind of some of the physical interactions between uh, different uh, cell types, so uh, sort of showing boundaries of different uh, clusters of cells as they're growing. Um, so a lot of other interesting work uh, that complements these sorts of efforts. And so so, um, so I guess just related to that, so we sort of, you pointed the Turing example of, um, 
of sort of a, a, a model that uh, shows dynamics. So, and we've got the data of the cell lineages. So, what do you think would be an, an appealing sort of next next step on on sort of a generative um, a generative model that would um, you know simulate the physics? So, in addition to having um, the event of cell splitting, like in a cell splitter, would there be other um, like algorithms that you would be interested to apply of like cells like sticking together or not sticking together or diffusion uh, of um, a cell splitter signal or um, what, what next things would you think um, you'd want to incorporate? Well, that's a tough question because, you know, you can get right down. I mean, you can include a lot of things. But I think, yeah, maybe like uh, diffusion models might be useful. Um, or maybe some sort of, you know, when I say generative, I mean, you know, it's like you're going from a single cell upward to a number of possibilities. But well, right now, from what I can tell from the data, I mean, we're not going to get like, a, you know, range of, po I mean, you might get a range of possibilities, but, um, you know, my my mind is always, always comes back to like some sort of genetic algorithm or something. I don't know why, it's, it's like a bias of mine, but, um, but also, you know, physical models are very important. And to have some sort of, you know, say some sort of, I guess, physical generative model that would, you know, give you a range of maybe possible phenotypes as opposed to what we actually see in the data. Um, you know, perhaps something that would, you know, take the data and maybe generate possibilities from that. And then, you know, you could see, like, you know, you'd say, well, given this um, transformation that we see in the data, maybe what could we, you know, what are the po possibilities that arise from that? Because development is very contingent. So, you know, once you reach a certain stage, you know, it's not like you get, like, you know, once you get, like, an, uh, maybe like a chicken embryo, you can't just get, like, you know, a worm from that. It's, you know, it's contingent. And so, you know, having maybe some sort of physical simulation of, you know, predict cells from different points in development, predict the possibilities at different points in development. Got it. And um, so if folks are um, wanting to help out, um, uh, where, where would you recommend uh, they go? Is there, I noticed that there is, uh, that you do have a, a repo on GitHub uh, called Devo Worm. Is that a good place to, for folks to start, or? Um... Uh, well, I don't have a lot up there. I mean, you know, like, I guess, what are, what are they interested in, like, reading more, or are they interested in, uh, is it, I mean, we don't, see, the thing is, we don't have a lot developed right now, I mean, the idea would be to get, like, you now I guess the first step, too, would be if they had ideas for how to proceed, to, like, you know, to hash it out and then maybe develop something, um, you know, if it's, because, you know, you just develop something, I guess it works, but to really kind of think through the problem a little bit before, you know, jumping in and see what really actually fits in with the data and with, you know, uh, but, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in, in collaborating, uh, contact myself or Steve, Stephen, probably myself, if, if you're interested in some of the, um, you know, simulations, if you want to talk about some of the, you know, how feasible some of the ideas are. So just in terms of lay of the land, too, for folks um, who want to know more, so the RDF um, piece that uh, Bradley was talking about is currently built into the Pi Open Worm. Uh, alpha branch, which we're um, shortly moving to the master branch, so that data is in there, and that's um, and that's one thing that uh, we can link to. And then um, this, uh, so the uh, various sources of data that uh, were contributed to Bradley, I'm sure he would make available if you emailed him as well. Okay. Um, and uh, those have been sort of basically put in the public domain, um, particularly the one with the images with um, the white lab. And so that was another question I wanted to ask you. How is that working with that data, Ben? Because uh, this is pretty cool, actually. Um, basically, John White like called up his lab and this, like, just had them dig this data up for basically us uh, for this for this endeavor specifically, um, which was really pretty cool and generous, and we really appreciate it. So um, I, I noticed some screenshots uh, in the in the presentation. Um, how's that been going? Um, is there collaboration around those images as well that, uh, that you can think of? Or Well, we haven't really gotten too much into the analysis of them yet. We've got them characterized in terms of what they are, what, what kind of... Because, I mean, he kind of gave us the uh, files, and then, that, you know, it's like 
that's it. I mean, it's fine. You know, it's it's great that we got the the data sharing, but like I, we were able to like figure out what the file, you know, files actually contained, what might be useful for our project. So, but we haven't done any analysis, and it might be kind of a, a place where we could use a lot of help, is if people have expertise in image processing or in, um, you know, taking apart video files uh, specific to microscopy, or even not. I mean, it's just a matter of pulling out data, pulling out features, feature recognition. But I do have the description of the files, so if you need the description of it, I can give you that. Um, okay. And uh, Richard made a comment also in my last uh, statement here. He said, uh, a simple thing to do is to check the robustness of C. elegans development by adding small variations to positions and angles. Um, I, think, uh, I think meaning that, um, right, so this is sort of along the lines of what you were saying earlier, which is that what would be really cool is to see, uh, once you have a, a model, is to see what happens when you start changing things and how would that, um, how would that differently result in the adult. Um, or, you know, um, how can we explain the, difference, the differences in mutations that we see in terms of the lineage tree or different things happening at the different points of lineage tree. Right. Um, so I think that would be interesting um, as well. And I do think your call for folks who can help with visualization would also be another very specific thing, which is like if you can, if you have some code to sort of render these trees uh, in, in a way that um, helps us understand changes in dynamics over time, that could also be very interesting. Yeah. So. The starting point, yeah. A lot of opportunity there, I think, because, I mean, you know, we don't, like, to bring the data together is probably the most important part of the project in terms of getting, like, a, you know, something that people can relate to. I mean, we have a lot of different potential sources of data. It's something we've talked about a lot. You know, how do you integrate it? How do you get uh, information from, say, like, the cells and, and integrate the semantic data, but make it in a way that you can understand it pretty easily? Yep. Um, I wanted to ask uh, if Rainer or Mark here in the in the room had any questions uh, that came up. Um, yeah, there's one question I was just wondering about. Um, given that we've got this fixed developmental pattern resulting in an invariant number of cells, I was just wondering if uh, C. elegans is capable of regenerating after so any kind of injury or something that causes it to lose a cell. Is, is, that, is that something the worm actually does? And uh, well, if, uh, um, yeah. if you oh, go to flatworms, yeah, if you go to flatworms, they actually, that's the model organism for regeneration. They're actually able to take like uh, there was one experiment where they took a flatworm and they blew away like 95% of the worm and then they had like a little piece <laughs> left and they regenerated the entire worm from that. Well, <laughs> meaning that there's some sort of like positional information there in the adult. But in C. Yeah. elegans, you know, I've looked for stuff and I figured, well, C. elegans, they must be doing work on this too. I don't really see anything in terms of regeneration. I think they, I, I'm not quite sure if they can. I don't even think people really studied it, so... Oh, okay. So this is something we maybe just don't really know much about. <laughs> well, so there is there is one example of regeneration that I know does get studied uh, in C. elegans because it, it happens uh, in a lab pretty nearby me. Um, so they do study axon regeneration in C. elegans. So they go in with a laser and they break or ablate or kill uh, the connection of a, of a axon passing through, say, the, the dorsal cord or the ventral cord, and it, it will regrow, and they use it as a model for trying to understand and better the regrowth processes that we might want to stimulate in spinal cord patients, uh, in humans, for example. So there is some work happening there. But I don't know how much further beyond axon regeneration the C. elegans would do. That's a, that's a good question. Okay, so we've got that work on cell damage, but at less on whether it can actually replace cells. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Yeah, so I was just sort of wondering if, uh, yeah, if there'd been much work done on that, and uh, and whether your model would be uh, would be would be useful in uh, account accounting for you know, uh, the worm, for worm body repair, for instance. Um, right. you know, after yeah. Yeah, I mean. I I, I haven't found any literature in it. Now, I assume that there, because it's a deterministic process, there probably is some information in the adult, because 
you know, everything is very specified. Um, on the other hand, it might, you know, I don't know what, what the rules there are. Um, all I know is that they do a lot of stuff in Flatworm, and they do stuff in other, you know, in, like, lizards and amphibians with, and fishes with regeneration, and they actually can regenerate a lot, too. It's a different mode of development, but it's it's really based on positional information. So that would be an interesting. Actually, something we could do, maybe, uh, is to just kind of make regenerative sea elegans. Like, you'd have a developmental model, and you'd say, we can really regenerate things, but what would it take to regenerate this piece of the phenotype yeah. that we have? Yeah, so related well, to that, Richard's also sort of chiming in. He's saying, experimentally, another simple set of experiments is to ablate individual cells at given stages of development and see predict what happens. So in the embryo, you could go in and say, OK, what if this cell, and you sort of pulled it out, and then you can see what the effect is later on uh, as the other cells try to figure out what to do without it. Um, so yeah, that would be pretty interesting. Mark, any questions from you? Oh, you're, you're really, really quiet. Sorry, can you, like, speak in the mic or something? I can barely hear you. I do not have a mic. Let me see if I can turn up your volume. Okay, go again. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, more or less. I'll, I'll repeat whatever your question is. Okay, uh, so the whole cell simulation, uh, you've probably heard of it. Uh, it's with a bacteria mycoplasma genitalium. Yeah. I was wondering if that actually is something that relates to our project at all. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with that one. Um, I've heard of some of the ones where they're trying to simulate individual cells, like with as much detail as possible in, in terms of what the cell, uh, how the cell operates. Is that very similar to the whole cell project? or? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, you know, in this case, we're kind of being selective about how the cells work. So, like, you know, our cell would be, you know, as much information as you can get on it. I mean, in those cases, they would build, like, you know, you have a bunch of biochemists and people who have studied all the pathways in the cell, and they try to put together a simulation of that. So they say, okay, here's a process. We know a lot about it. Let's incorporate information. Let's incorporate this information about it the genomics, and, and so forth. And then they build like a, they try to emulate the cell. In our case, we're a little bit different because we don't, you know, we're sort of saying, well, we know that cells divide. We have that information. We also know they have a genome, but we don't have a lot of detail there. So we're going to sort of ignore that. We're going to just focus on the cells and how they do their thing. And if we can add some genomics or something into it, it's, it's OK. But that's not really the level of simulation that we're doing here. I think we're focusing more on like how cells divide and how cells form phenotypes. But in that sense, even at that level, um, we're still being pretty selective about what we're modeling. We're not. I don't think it's our goal to incorporate everything. Like uh, some some modeling projects, they try to just incorporate as much as possible and get a you know a, a vast amount of detail. And whether that's actually informative or you know, like understanding a developmental process is questionable because you devote a lot of computational power to the you know simulating all the processes like you know um, uh, generation of RNA or generation of proteins, but you don't necessarily get like a process like development. It doesn't tell you a lot about that. I mean, it tells you about different aspects of it, but I think we're being a bit more general than something like. Uh, whole cell simulation where you know, they're yeah. just trying to get synthesize what we know about the cell. So yeah, and um, so we've actually done um, an open worm journal club on uh, that whole cell simulation. Um, so if folks ever want to check that out, you can go check that out on our, on our YouTube channel, open worm YouTube channel. Um, and it does differ from this, although it does have cell division as one part of it, but it doesn't yeah. consider too much relationships between um, a bunch of cells um, and each other, and it doesn't really consider much beyond a single division, whereas I think here we're trying to think of lineages of a whole organism that uh, has is you know, composed of hundreds of cells up to about a thousand cells. 
So, um, I and, and I'd also say that the whole cell model is considering a lot more of yeah the biochemical pathways internal to the cell as opposed to say you know morphogenesis, which is all about creating shapes out of aggregations of cells uh, with each other. Um, I dream of a day though when all of these different aspects of uh, the cells are all combined because in the end the biology has all of them. So inside the C. elegans cells as they're dividing they have all these biochemical processes that are starting to be addressed by models like the whole cell. And there's this other phenomenon which, which Bradley has been very eloquent about here today that relate to how those clusters of cells are going to relate to each other and signals are going to send each other to form a larger organism. So they're really both sides of the same biological picture. It's just that in 2014 it's still hard to put models like this all together uh, so that they all you know, speak to a single organism, plus it's just it's really hard to get all the data out for a given, given organism. And so we're still in early days of, of putting those things together. But they certainly have a relationship to each other, but it's not yet at the point where we can just plug and play. This kind of thing, so. Cool. All right. And I was, uh, let's see. Got any more questions from the audience? Check in here. Anything? Oh, actually, we got a couple of things. Oh, oh, all right. Wow, a lot of things. Okay, so Richard says a close look at mosaic organisms shows some regulation, regeneration during development, and likewise, many regulative embryos have some features that are mosaic. Okay, so there is some. Right. Okay, so mosaic organisms have some. Uh, Regeneration. Okay. Then he's pointing at a couple of papers. And then Timothy Warrington says, My understanding is generally C. elegans can't regenerate. There have been some experiments of bleeding cells during development, and often those structures derived from those cells are missing. So, yeah, so it does sound like if you do start to knock stuff out, then you're going to have missing pieces. So. Cool. Yeah. All right, let me just see if there's any other... Okay. Nope, I don't think so. And so we're just about at the end of our time. So um, let me go ahead and thank Bradley very much uh, for this presentation and, uh, and your collaborators uh, as well. So I think this has been a very good opportunity to get a sense of what's going on here and a good call to action and help. So um, if you are watching and you want to get involved, please do reach out to Bradley um, and uh, or myself, and I will forward it to Bradley. But uh, he's sort of the source of this. And as we go into the future, um, we'll be seeing more and more of this on GitHub and out on blogs and social media and so forth. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks to our panelists, Mark and Rainer, for joining us. And uh, stay tuned for an upcoming Open Room Journal Club on another interesting topic. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.